Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com, here with uh, 10 questions you should ask yourself at year end. I love the year end process, and a number of years ago I read an article uh, about how someone used that week between Christmas and New Year's as a uh, planning week, as a strategy week, and every day was focused on a different uh, piece of personal and professional development, and that uh, really inspired me to think about my own year-end process and every year I've tried to ratchet it up uh, I actually usually call it the power week or something like that And it's basically an opportunity for me to you know take a step back to not focus on producing on creating but more on uh, Reflecting on where I've been think about the year that's come uh, previously and and focus on where I can uh, ratchet up my efforts and and better focus what I'm doing uh, in the new year. And I think as investors, we a lot of times avoid that uh, really natural process at year end to hit pause on, on trading, hit pause on the markets, and just focus on how we did and really try to learn and internalize all the lessons that we, uh, that we should uh, given, uh, given the experiences that we've had. So I sort of jotted down 10 questions that I try to answer at the end of every year. And I hope uh, by giving you these 10 questions, by sharing how I'd answer them right now, it encourages you to create your own list, whether you start with that. It's a great list to start with. I'd encourage you to take it and tweak it and make it your own and uh, try to answer your own questions uh, along the way. And if you do that consistently, do it year after year, you'll find uh, you'll be able to chart a really beautiful path of growth for you, hopefully as an investor, as a, uh, as a human being. So here are the 10 questions. Number one, how did I perform this year? And just try to summarize uh, your performance in, uh, in 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 one sentence or in a couple sentences. Um, you know, so for me, obviously, I'm you know I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal trading, but for me, it's more about my work as a strategist and how I've been able to illuminate the markets and understand them, and uh, you know, not predict them, but uh, but certainly uh, try to anticipate them and try to uh, and try to present them in an effective way. Overall, pretty well, and and as I would as I would think about my own way that I've approached this market, you know, I hammer in in my show the final bar, and in presentations that I do, I hammer the uh, lessons of momentum investing, of trend following, and I would say, if you're a trend follower this year, for the most part, you were on the right side of things, and stocks that did particularly well, like semiconductors, come to mind, stocks that did rather poorly, uh, you know, energy up until the last, you know, six to eight weeks of the year uh, and others, you know, overall, I think you were in the right in the right places. And in particular, I think it allowed you to pivot from the leadership of the FANG stocks to other emerging uh, groups. And, you know, if there's one thing I feel like I got right, it was uh, it was that rotation away from the FANG trade and into other things that were starting to work. Um, how would I, you know, what could I have done better? Uh, I certainly, you know, as with most people, did not think the bottom was in place until well after it was uh, it was true. I think, you know, in April and May, and this will, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a bit of a taste of my answer, of my worst trade of the year. But, you know, I think in, in April and May, I was still pretty negative on things. And, and that probably came out in the way I portrayed the market. And I think that's something that over the course of the year I've learned uh, you know to, that that it's not a an emotional decision, and I knew that. But but in terms of how I actually characterize the market, I think I was I was characterizing it a little more negatively in April and May than I than I probably should have, uh, given the strength out of lows and the fact that we had higher highs and higher lows. It looks really clear now, months and months later. But at the time, uh, I was pretty certain we were going to go and retest the lows again. We certainly never did. Question number two. So question one, how was your performance? How would you summarize it? And that was how I, in a rambling fashion, summarized my own. Question number two, what was your best trade of the year? Uh, and what can you learn from that? Uh, you know, so for me, I, thankfully, I have a couple things I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, proud of. But if there's one trade, it's probably recently, which was uh, Bitcoin. So I don't, I don't trade uh, actual Bitcoin. Again, in my, in my own account, I do very little trading. I try to focus and get my insights in front of other people as much as I can. But I did uh, by GBTC, which is a Bitcoin investment trust, which I'm not a huge fan of using exchange traded products, you know, trusts and uh, limited partnerships and things like that. It's not my ideal scenario, but, you know, I saw an opportunity. I bought it when Bitcoin was around 14,000. I sold it when Bitcoin was around 19,000. Bitcoin could go much, much higher from there. And I think it probably will eventually. Uh, but for me, it was a it was recognizing that the Bitcoin chart was making a big base. And I like the fact that it was a very symmetrical relationship between the early part of the year from end of last year 
to where we're at now is just sort of this beautiful bottoming pattern. And it just felt like we kept stepping higher. And then we, as we pulled back to 14,000, it felt like a really good time to, to get into it. So I use GPTC for that, which I feel pretty good at. I'm, I'm now out of that trade. Uh, and, and of course had immediate remorse when the moment Bitcoin started to tick a little bit higher and, and tease 20,000 hasn't done it yet. Uh, but overall, I, you know, those sorts of things, I've, I've bought Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin in the form of GBTC twice now, and it's in that sort of scenario. And I'm finding the way that I'm comfortable using Bitcoin is less as a long-term investment, but more as opportunistic when I see some sort of a breakout like that. So I feel good about that one. Uh, what was your worst trade of the year and what could you learn from it? And that is, in, uh, I've had a couple of worst trades, but but the one that stands out to me goes back to my comment about, you know, remaining bearish in April and May, probably too long. And I bought SDS. Uh, and <laughs> it's so embarrassing. I bought it in uh, in uh, in um, sort of the end of March, uh, early April period. And, you know, if you know the chart of the S&P, we sort of, uh, you know, March 23rd was the low quick rebound out of there. A couple of days later, we ended up hitting that the short term peak. And then we ended up having a higher low the first week in April. And so I bought it really right at the end of March, just before um, the pullback. And so, you know, and, and and what I was generally thinking was, this is a lower high among that, you know, coming off of the February peak, I am buying SES, which is a short, uh, you know, a double short uh, S&P 500 uh, ETF, leveraged ETF. Uh, and uh, and so I, I thought, all right, perfect. This is going to be the next leg down. We're going to retest the lows. And that was the thesis. And I bought it. And for one day, for about 24 hours, I felt like a rock star. It gained. The market came off. And I was like, that's it. This is the beginning of the next leg lower. And then that changed. About three days later, the S&P sort of gapped back up, went above my entry point, and then just continued higher into, uh, into April. And I held on to that SDS position as the market kept going higher, and I dug in my heels on it. And it's exactly what I coach people not to do. I did it, uh, which was hold on to something that wasn't working because I was convinced my thesis was going to work, and it, and it just didn't. And you know, I've talked to people since then. One of the great things I learned from that bottom is at some point between the March low and really the June, July period, you should have been convinced that the trend was positive. And I think it took me a little longer. I think that higher low in April should have been it for me. And I should have known this is the beginning of, of much greater upside. Uh, and, and I and I held on to a, a trade that was not working. It's also yet another reminder. I have very few examples of using leveraged ETFs and having it work out in my favor. So that's how I would say my, my worst trade. So my, my, what I learned from that, stay away from leveraged ETFs. It's not something I enjoy or I'm comfortable with, especially as more of a long-term investor. It's just not a great vehicle. Uh, and number two, just admit when you're wrong and, and, uh, and, and exit out of it quicker. Question number four, we should probably accelerate the pace here. What did I miss this year um, in terms of uh, overall performance? So we talked about your, your, your portfolio. What, how did you perform your best trade, your worst trade? Now it's what did you not, you know, catch? What what was out there that you missed? And so, you know, what what did you miss? Um, you know, for me, I would say, you know, it's probably back to my earlier comment. I think I missed how quickly the market turned from a downturn to an upturn, and I, and I eventually caught on to it. And around June, was talking a lot about you know getting back above the two hundred day and the acceleration to the upside. And I feel pretty comfortable with how I handled things after that point. But before then, I think I was very, uh, you know, kicking and screaming would admit that the market was more positive. And so, you know, I think in terms of what I miss, I missed opportunities to recognize, uh, you know, uh, opportunistic moves out of those lows and some of the stocks that accelerated. Um, yeah, so, that, so I think that's probably the one, the one that I would answer. Um, I have to think about that. And that's another one I'll probably think about a little more after I'm done recording the, uh, the special. Question number five, top performers in your space, uh, which... which stocks or ETS, whatever you're trading, which stocks did the best and uh, were you there or not? So looking at the S&P 500 year to date, you know, there are a couple outliers that did exceptionally well. Etsy was the top performer up about 270% year to date. Uh, Carrier Global in the industrial sector up about 210%. And then there's a big jump down to semiconductor stocks like NVIDIA and AMD and then L Brands was number uh, number four up 126%. So there's a handful of stocks, six stocks so far. PayPal is the six that were up 100% or more year to date here, recording this in uh, in uh, the second week in December. So there's some stocks that actually performed really, really well on an absolute basis and on a relative basis. Um, you know, so was I there? You know, so overall, I've talked about semiconductors for quite a while, so I feel pretty good about uh, you know recognizing things like Nvidia and AMD that were doing uh, well. We've talked about the SMH a lot on my show, and have, uh, and have really focused on that. I think that. 
idea of the XLK technology being, uh, you know, leadership in the, you know, being a bellwether, meaning it performs well in uptrends and performs well in downtrends. I think that was, uh, you know, that's a, it's a great thesis, but I think that's changed a bit. And semiconductors are now the, uh, the bellwether. That's like the core position, something that does well, outperforms in bull phases and in bear phases. So I think semiconductors have been very good and I see that continuing going into next year. So I feel pretty good about being in, uh, in that one. Um, you know, what did I miss? Probably, I, I guess, something like uh, L Brands. Boy, that was something I would not have expected to do so well. Um, and so I think I, I sort of understood the semiconductor performance thesis, but I don't think I bought into something like L Brands, but certainly the chart should have compelled you to recognize the uh, the strength in there. And in some model portfolios we run internally, that's somewhere, uh, that's certainly a place I was. Bottom performers, what uh, performed the worst and did you own any of those and why? If you look at the bottom performers in the S&P this year, year to date going through uh, you know early mid-December, it's things like travel stocks, cruise lines, Carnival cruise lines and Norwegian cruise lines were two of the worst. Um, the rest are all energy stocks, E&P stocks, all uh, ex uh, equipment services, exploration and production. Um, so it's uh, FTI, Occidental, FANG, which is Diamondback Energy, Marathon Oil, Holly Frontier, uh, those are all down, uh, you know, 50% or more or, or close to that. Um, you know, so was I in those? No, and certainly, you know, I, I've, if there's one thing I annoyed myself with saying so much was staying away from energy. And that was certainly the play for the longest time. It kept, I don't feel bad about, and that's one, one important thing. I don't feel really bad about missing the huge reversal in energy. Um, I would have, you know, and, and, and after it gaps higher and follows through, I've certainly been talking about, the strength there, I, I will never feel bad about missing something that is at all time lows or really at strong lows in a downtrend and then gaps higher and reverses. I don't think as a technical analyst, that's something I'm, I'm particularly equipped to try to do in, in terms of my toolkit, which is trend following. Um, but I do feel bad about not recognizing trends after they've, they've emerged. So if you look at some of those charts like Occidental, like FANG, they're looking pretty good now and are starting to outperform. And that's why I think they are uh, they are uh, reasonable at this point. But leading up to this point, I don't feel bad about missing that. The third set of questions is uh, all about routine. And so question number seven, uh, how do you feel about your routines? What are your, your routines like uh, this year? And overall, I feel really good about that. Uh, you know, for me, I've always been pretty good about having daily and week weekly routines that are important. Uh, starting my show, which was over a year ago, was last fall, The Final Bar which is our closing bell show, uh, that caused me, that forced me to really be diligent with how I was producing content uh, and, and, and also be diligent about my routines. I, needed to have a, I need to have a good weekly and daily routine to make sure that I'm able to do a good job and, and, and inform our viewers and illuminate the markets for that show. So I feel better than I have uh, probably in, in, uh, over my career, probably the best I felt about the routines that I have in place. So that's good. Question number eight, your weekly routine. How is that and where can you improve it? Um, so for me, my weekly routine actually starts on Thursday and ends on Monday, which is kind of weird, but it's really built around year end. So I start Thursday writing a note to clients that goes out Friday morning, Friday afternoon. Um, and then Friday is my uh, weekly wrap show on, uh, on the final bar. So at that point, I've really focused on the macro conditions. Over the weekends, usually on Sunday, I'll look at uh, the S&P 500 stocks. Uh, you often it's a Monday morning, go through the, the 500 charts and focus on patterns and themes with sectors and groups. And that leads up to Monday's show, which is a, uh, uh, you know, looking at the market uh, macro sectors and stocks. And so overall, that weekly routine has actually been pretty good. If there's one thing that I have tweaked that I think I want to focus on more, I, I realized I didn't have a lot of sentiment stuff in my weekly routine. I had a little bit. But now I, I think one of the core things I'm looking at are the extremes in sentiment, things like euphoria uh, or euphoric readings of the put call ratio in the AAII survey and the RIDEX flows in the name exposure index. And I had all of those in chart list, but I didn't really focus on them. So that's now in my weekly routine. I added that just recently. My daily routine, you know, uh, how do you know, how do you feel about your daily routine? What could you do better? Uh, is this question uh, number nine? And for me, uh, I feel pretty good. I could probably do better. I am not super consistent. I have a couple charts that I will look at every morning, the daily chart of the S&P, the weekly chart of the S&P, uh, and then top performers, and I'll go from there. I would love to uh, be a little better about being consistent about looking at all of the other asset classes. So a lot of times I'll catch gold and uh, bonds as I look later in the day at what's happening. But I think first thing in the morning, it's great to reinforce the key trends that you want to pay attention to. And that's something I'm going to be working on for my daily routine uh, for next year. That's on my list for the end of the, uh, the last week of the year. 
Question number 10, the final question, maybe the most important one. How do you feel about the other nine questions that you've just answered? And, and this gets, I think, to one of the most core uh, uh, thought process, just your mindset, right? How you approach all of this. I think you have to approach investing from a place of humility, from a place of imperfection. Um, the investors that I have grown to respect and appreciate in my dealings with them over my career are not perfect. And they will readily admit there that they are not perfect. I think there's a bravado, there is a uh, um, uh, you know a, a an attitude that is implied by you know money managers and managing assets and 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 performing well. And I just I don't think that's that that is something that's sort of like your Facebook image. That's the social media image you probably want to put out there. I think if you want to be a, a well-rounded and well-informed and, and well-adjusted inv investor, you need to have an honest conversation with yourself. And I think, you know, going through these other questions that we've talked about are important uh, thought process, an important process to, you know, uh, to go through regularly with yourself. And I'm glad you're going through this uh, exercise with me this year. Um, so for me, how do I feel about it? I feel pretty good. I, I feel like, um, you know, overall, I missed some things, but I, I think there were clear lessons that I learned from it. When I'm looking back at you know, how did I manage February and March and, and April uh, of this year? I feel okay with it. I mean, I, I certainly feel like I could have recognized the exit out of that bear phase more quickly. And I, and I was able, I think I've, I've tweaked my process since then and certainly tweaked, reinforced the value of focusing on trends and higher highs and higher lows, and lower lows and lower highs. And so I feel pretty good about, about, about that. Overall, I feel like there were um, successes that I can build on and there were uh, there were misses that I can learn from. And I think that's probably the most important thing. On that last point, if you are you know interested in thinking about how you thinking uh, uh, think about as an investor, <clears throat> thinking about how you think as an investor, check out my own YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior. We do a lot of regular exercises along these lines, trying to think about how you think, focusing on routines, decision making, and how you structure your days and your weeks. So I hope to see you over on my uh, channel there. Uh, but overall, I hope you found that this is a great exercise. 10 questions you should ask yourself uh, at year end. I hope you go through and answer each of those 10 questions on your own. Put it in your list for the end of uh, 2021. And I hope your answers uh, continue to improve every year. For StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great year end. Happy holidays. We'll see you next year. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.